Hi, my name is Carolina, and thank you for attending this virtual event organized by Word Up Community Bookshop. If you don't know, Word Up is a community bookshop and art space run by local residents, many of whom are volunteers. We started as a one month long pop up shop in 2011, then stuck around due to overwhelming community demand. And this past June, we actually celebrated our 10th anniversary. We can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street in Washington Heights, New York City. We host events for all ages and sell used and new books in English and Spanish. Check us out at wordupbooks.com to shop and see other virtual and uh, in-person events now that we have. We're open Tuesdays through Fridays, 12 to 6 p.m., Saturdays, 11 to 5 p.m. And I'm very excited to introduce um, who's going to start us off at After Hours Editions editor, Eric Amling. Uh, hi, good evening. Yep, yeah, I'm Eric Amling, co editor of After Hours Editions. And very excited for everyone to be here tonight to celebrate Equestrian Monuments, uh, a book that was in the making for over 10 years uh, that are. Translators, I'm sure, could um, you know, speak at length about uh, by the poet, Costa Rican poet, Luis Chavez. And I uh, total honor to be able to publish this book, uh, I believe his first English edition. Um, and thank you to Word Up for hosting this event and for our special guests, uh, Jay Despande and Mary Jo Bang, who will also be reading. And I'm going to get things started, handing over to Julie and Sam, and yeah, enjoy the evening. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are so glad to be with you tonight, celebrating this beautiful book. Thank you all for coming. And um, we would like to dedicate this evening to um, my dear friend and teacher and mentor, Richard Howard. Um, who is uh, one of the greatest translators and poets and human beings of our time. Um, so this night is for him. We want to ground in some gratitude and then uh, get started with a night that's going to be full of poetry and translation and genius and warmth and um, all the good things Luis Chavez seems to bring uh, close to him uh, wherever he goes. Um, <clears throat> Our first bit of gratitude is to Word Up uh, for all that you do in the community and for hosting us here tonight. Um, our second big piece of gratitude is to Sarah Jean Grimm and Eric Amling, um, who form After Hours Editions. Uh, you all have wonderful taste in partners, uh, books, and babies, um, particularly good taste in, in translations. Thank um, <clears throat> you, Chavez, uh, for trusting us. Um, with the translation of your beautiful work. Uh, you're a genius and an innovator, and we have nothing like you uh, in this space. And so uh, we are deeply indebted for the chance to bring uh, an analog uh, into it. Um, <clears throat> we want to thank Editorial Germinal for first releasing uh, Monumentos Secuestres and for uh, Encino Ediciones releasing it again here uh, soon. Um, and we wanna thank uh, these readers who are gonna open us up tonight. Uh, Jay Deshpande and Mary Jo Bang um, are poets and translators and hearts and minds and people um, we admire so much. We just feel so honored to be joined. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the final thank you is to all of you. Uh, you are coming in from all over the world, from here uh, in North America, Central America, South America, um, I'm here in the sort of ancestral lands of the Lenape people, otherwise known as New York. Um, but we know we have representation from Louisiana to Oregon, um, you know, Texas, and of course, uh, all the way down to San Jose, Costa Rica. So this is really big. Um, we're in for a treat tonight. And Carolina, I'll let you introduce uh, our first reader. So our first reader tonight is Jay Tishbande, who is the author of Love the Stranger and the chapbook of The Rest of the American rest of the body. Um, welcome. Thank you so much, Carolina. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's such an honor to be here and celebrating this beautiful book. Um, it's like such a thrill to get to hold this now. And I was truly blown away. Like, 
thank you to Eric and Sarah Jean and to Luis, of course, um, and to Word Up for sending this to me because it's just so cool to like have this in my hands while while looking forward to the the poems and the translations. Um, I'm very honored to be with you all. I'm going to read two translations and then two of my own poems, all brief pieces. Uh, for the last decade or so, I've been translating the Egyptian poet Georges Renard, who uh, kind of started the surrealist movement in Cairo uh, in the 1930s and 40s. So uh, I'm first going to read a brief manifesto of his called Perspectives that he uh, dedicated to Henri Breton, who was a friend who he was in touch with as he lived in Egypt and in France. Perspectives. Why not meet on a footbridge stretched between two catastrophes, a woman with galloping eyes who tells you her name more beautiful to climb than a cliff draped in black fabric? Why not organize the always empty stage of the horizon with great multicolored sunsets of hair come undone? Why not cover the mountainsides and creatures with radium groins who ha have sex with the landscape and burn it with embraces until they lie alone in a dizzying light? Why not liberate all at once the myriads of mirrors nailed to the bedside tables of the earth? Why not make life livable? Why not abandon the accustomed flesh and the already lived out fates? Why not open the eyelids of cursed roads and vanish into the thickest night forever carrying the stranger's body cut in tiny pieces with a sharpened dream and no risk of waking up? And the second poem of his uh, is called The Interior Woman. Uh, and this is gonna be in, in Poetry Magazine next month. The Interior Woman. Stunning like lightning stopped mid sky to choose its tree. Unknown, near enough to fear, but reassuring like a rest in temperate country. Navigational light that holds in its pupil the direction of night, crumbling like a handshake between two beings without a future, hard like the beginning of the world. The face turns away just once in a lifetime, pulling the trigger. And I'll now read two of mine briefly. This poem is called Jenner, California. We stay in a room the ocean accepts as its accompaniment. Picture frame window, one bright line across it. Afterthought continuously that the sound of crashing waves makes heard through the insulation like a film about apocalypse. Last night, the party, the ungentleness of love, of loving your friends, of loving too much what you think you are to your friends. Through the insulation, I know the kelp beds float red and slick and competent. The drugs wear off slowly, aria in a cavernous theater. To feel or to stop feeling, I would give everything. When I get up today, I will go outside and walk the cliff's edges, remembering a kind of script for wilderness and sadness. I'll watch sunsets thicken golds and purples, let everything growing be not just green, but what it is, wet from within. And lastly, this poem is called Quiet Night, New Moon. Thank you again, and thank you and congratulations to Sam and Julia and Louise. Quiet Night, New Moon and what skinks along the sidewalk like a long white border carrying me home is not the cat I hear at left plunge metallically into leaves piled fat and wide, leaves that in another light would be the same color as the cat. But for the dark here to carry me home would be unsettling. I know I go to places by myself with mind made wild by night and night's indifference. Yes, I hear it whistle through its teeth. One block more of crosswalks, gentle math 
which makes pattern what good shepherd to me. I want its black and white to go forever. I do, and it does. Yes, and breath or prayer. Good night. All of it falls onto me. What I have given of myself, I gave up willingly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, and for our next reader, we have Mary Jo Bang, who is the author of eight books of poems, including A Doll for Throwing, Louise in Love, and Elegy. Welcome. Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me, um, Julia and Sam and Luis, um, to be here. I'm so excited for this book. As you know, I've just taught it in a class on translation and poetry. And um, I, um, I love it. And I'm so happy because I don't speak Spanish that I can now read um, Luis's work. And um, so thank you. And thank you, Jay, for those amazing poems. And thank you, Word Up and uh, Carolina. And After Hours Press, you've made a beautiful book. And um, thank you for, as I said, including me. So I'm going to read the first canto of Dante's Paradiso. And um, I don't know what to say about it. Um, Dante, I think, speaks for himself. So um, I'll just start. Canto one. The glory of the animator of everything pervades the universe and shines more in one area and less somewhere else. I was in the heaven that gets more of its rays and saw things that those who come down from on high can't grasp or else can't say, because nearing what it wants, our intellect is so overcome that our memory is left behind. Even so, as much of the holy kingdom as my mind could hold on to will now be the subject of my song. O fair Apollo, for this last task, make me as worthy a vessel as you expect in order to grant the beloved laurel. Until this point, one of the two Parnassian peaks was enough for me, but now I need both to enter this final playing field. Enter my chest and inspire as you did when you dragged Marseus, sheath and shelterless from the skin of his limbs. O oh, divine power, if you give me enough of yourself to reveal even a flicker of the blissful realm inscribed on my mind, You'll see me reach the foot of your beloved tree and crown myself with its leaves, which you and my theme will make sure I'm entitled to. So seldom, Godfather, are they selected for the triumph of a Caesar or a poet. Blame those shameful human cravings. That whenever a heart is thirsty for the leafy offspring of Pinius's daughter, it should deliver a bundle of joy to a delighted Delphic deity a little spark, later a great flame, so that maybe better voices after me will manage to get Sarah's to answer their prayers. The world's sun lamp rises toward mortals by various routes, but the one that fuses four circles with three crosses takes the best skyway and is linked to the best star and sets and seals the worldly wax more in its own image. That path had made morning there and evening here, and almost all of that hemisphere light, and this one dark, when I saw Beatrice turn and look up and to the left at the sun. An eagle never held on for so long. The same way a second ray usually blasts off from the first and bounces up like a rocket man who longs to come back. Seeing what she did inspired me to imagine doing it, and so I did. I fixed my eyes on the sun for longer than we usually do. Much is allowed there that our powers here don't permit, since this place was designed only with the human race in mind. I couldn't bear it for very long, but not so little that I didn't see it outlined in star-like sparks, the way iron comes sizzling from the fire. It suddenly seemed like daylight plus daylight, as if that one had managed to decorate the heavens with a second sun. Beatrice stood there, 
her eyes fixed only on the eternal wheels, and I turned my eyes from what was higher up to her light. Her look was such that it made me become inside what Glaucus became from tasting the herb, a true partner in an ocean of other gods. It's not possible to put into words what trans human means, but the example suffices for those allowed by grace to experience it. If, if I were only the me you'd most recently created, love that governs the heavens, you would know it was you who lifted me with your light. When the wheel, which desire for you makes eternal, got my attention with that harmony you discern and direct, it seemed so much of the sky was lit by the flame of the sun that neither rain nor river ever made a lake so wide. The novelty of the sound and the great light never before felt so intensely lit a wish inside me to know what had caused them. She who saw through me as well as I saw myself in order to hush my excited mind, even before I could ask, opened her mouth and began. You get all mixed up by sticking with a figment of your imagination. So don't see what you would see if you shook it off. You're not as you believe on earth. In truth, lightning bolting out of the blue never raced as fast as you back to your beginning. If I was freed of the first doubt by way of her smiling little chat, I was already deeply enmeshed in the next one. I said, I was happy staying wonderstruck, but now I'm wondering how I'm able to go beyond these weightless elements. And was she, after a charitable sigh, looked straight at me with that look of pity a mother gives a kid who's acting bonkers and began, all things have order among themselves and this orderliness is what makes the universe resemble God. Here the higher creatures observe the imprint of divine worth, which is the end goal of having whatever's created obey that rule. In the order I'm describing, all natures are inclined toward the primal source some bend closer, some less so, depending on their type. So they move over the great sea of being to various ports, and each brings with it the inclination it's been given. This one drives fire toward the moon. This one motivates the hearts of mortals. This one presses tight on earth and unifies it. It's not only creatures without intelligence that this bow strikes, but also those that have intelligence and love. Divine providence, which settles all of this, makes that heaven remain still while the fastest one spill, spins just inside it. And now we're being taken there to that preordained place by the power of a guide rope fired at a joyful target. It is true, forms don't, often don't correspond to the intent of the art. This because tone deaf material fails to respond Similarly, a creature once put in motion will sometimes depart from the course and bend toward another realm, the same way one sometimes sees a flash of fire break from a cloud, as if a natural instinct got twisted by a bogus pleasure. You going up by my lights is no more amazing than that a mountaintop stream will flow downhill to the lowest point. It would be shocking if you, freed from every impediment had stayed below, as if on earth an active fire stood still. At that, she turned her face back to the heavens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. Um, and now I'm so happy to introduce our editors, um, sorry, our translators and poets um, for the book we're celebrating tonight. Um, Julia Getz is the author of In an Invisible Glass Case, which is also a frame. And Samantha Ziegelboin is the author of The Fat Sonnets. And Luis Chavez, is considered one of the most important contemporary authors in Costa Rica. He has written poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. Welcome. Yes, yes. All right. So we three are going to have 
Uh, we're going to do a collaborative reading of the title poem, which Louise, I think it's in 34 parts. If I might be wrong on that, 34 I'm parts. Not, I'm not sure how many, uh, but there, um, pretty, that's pretty close, 30, yes. 35. Okay. So Luis is going to read one part in Spanish, and then Julia and I will alternate reading the English we translated. So you'll be able to hear the Spanish and the English side by side as we go through the title poem, Equestrian Monument. Okay. First, first, I would like to uh, say thanks, of course, to Julia and Sam uh, for the work they've made with this book. Um, Eric and Sara and Marlo uh, for publishing it. Uh, Jay and Mary Jo for being here today and sharing their poems. Also for Edith Grossman, Ricardo Maldonado and uh, Chan Shanahan. The, I don't know if that's uh, um, pronounced correctly for writing a little bit about the book and also I was just thinking while Mary Jo was reading that um, her translation that this is what happens with some of the translations that we that we read or we listen to. In the best case scenario, the work becomes work of the of the translator. That was, for me, that was a poem by Mary Jo Bang. Yes, yes. Exactly. And that's beautiful. Beautiful. Muchas gracias. Um, vamos con Monumentos Secuestres. Dale. <laughs> this, is what, monument. This, this is also what Julia and Sam did, of course. It, they uh, made it better. <laughs> okay, vamos, monumentos secuestres. Una letanía. Ah, uh, something I have to tell all of you, uh, a little secret. Costa Rica doesn't have equestrian monuments. Stop it. That's a little <laughs> secret I kept. <laughs> there are no equestrian monuments in Costa Rica. All the monuments, a lot of them, but no horses. Okay. <laughs> Monumentos secuestres, una letanía. Fotos mal enfocadas frente a monumentos secuestres. La bruma de la droga, anécdotas de bajo impacto y pasajes de películas mal dobladas. Con esto llegamos a los 40. No seamos mal agradecidos, podría ser peor. Equestrian monuments, a litany. Out of focus photographs in front of equestrian monuments. The fog of the drug, low impact anecdotes, scenes from badly dubbed films. With this, we arrive at our 40s. We shouldn't be ungrateful. It could be worse. Aquel año terminando en el mes de los pericos, que a nadie dejaban dormir con sus chillidos de mentes. Fecha cuando bajamos los brazos creyendo que los subíamos. The year ending with the month of parakeets who didn't let anyone sleep with their demented squawking. The day we lowered our arms believing we were raising them. Un brazo, el fragmento de un brazo, congelado en el borde izquierdo, la foto donde posamos como turistas en la ciudad más fea del mundo, la extremidad salida de cuadro avanzando hacia un destino sin valor para la historia, esa foto, la mecánica de la sonrisa activada por la señal del desconocido que la tomó. An arm, a fragment of an arm congealed on the left margin, the photograph in which we're posing like tourists in the ugliest city of the world, an extremity outside the frame pointing towards a place without historical value, that photograph, the mechanics of a smile set in motion by a signal 
from the stranger who was taking it. La poesía es la voz del recuerdo. Aquí, sin embargo, se habla del futuro. No del abstracto, no de la posteridad. En media hora saldremos de esta oficina conscientes de que el mes entrante, como los últimos 49, tampoco podremos renunciar. Poetry is the voice of memory. Here, however, we speak of the future, not of the abstract, not of posterity. In half an hour, we'll be leaving this office, conscious that in the coming months, the same as the last 49, we can't resign. Para no pensar en lo inminente, especulemos sobre el destino del compañero de primaria que forraba sus cuadernos de rosado. O seamos prácticos y calculemos los impuestos. To keep from dwelling on the imminent, let's speculate about the fate of a friend from elementary school who always covered his notebooks in pink. Or to be practical, let's calculate our taxes. Dios guarde, piensa. Dios guardi, dice. May God keep you, she thinks. Blessing, she says. Cada cuatro meses, cual chequeo técnico, mamá pregunta si soy gay. Every four months, like a technical inspection, mom asks if I'm gay. Hijo, abandonando la mesa, nos vemos mañana. Madre, entre dientes. Si Dios quiere. Son, leaving the table. See you tomorrow. Mother, under her breath. God willing. Yes. Vacaciones del 91, turno vespertino, digitando el catálogo de copias piratas. El exorcista, en repeat, por semanas. Hasta aprender de memoria los diálogos de los que 15 años después, nada queda. El ejercicio inútil de unas vacaciones, la crisis de los 40 a los 22. Vacation of 91, evening shift, downloading the catalog of bootlegs, The Exorcist, on repeat for weeks, to commit the dialogue to memory. 15 years later, nothing remains. The useless exercise of a vacation, the crisis of 40 at 22. La maleza crece cuando dejamos de mirar. Los años se acumulan mientras nos ocupamos de la maleza. Aprender esto nos tomó más tiempo del que hubiéramos querido. The weeds grow when we're not watching them. Years accumulate while we worry about the weeds. Learning this took longer than we would have liked. Nos vemos mañana. Dios primero me corrige. See you tomorrow. She corrects me, God willing, yes. Del sol, otra vez superado por rotación y traslación, quedan escasos minutos de luz naranja favoreciendo las siluetas de los viejos inmóviles del parque. ¿Es así o es lo que veo a través del filtro atenuante de 10 miligramos de clonazepam? From the sun, surpassed again by rotation and refraction, a few minutes of orange light are left, clattering the silhouettes of the park elderly, unmoving. This is how it is, or this is how I see it through the extenuating filter of 10 milligrams of clonic pen. La bruma de la droga, anécdotas de bajo impacto, y pasajes de películas mal dobladas a esa hora de la mañana en que a los travestis les crece la barba. The fog of the drug, low impact anecdotes, scenes from badly dubbed films at that hour of the morning when drag queens begin to grow beards. Vicios que explican la mirada vidriosa de quien vio al otro que en una zona libre de la mesa, ocupada por electrodomésticos robados, planchaba primero billetes viejos para después, minucioso, 
Restaurarlos con cinta scotch. Vices explain the glassy stare of someone who saw somebody else ironing the old bills first on a table otherwise occupied by stolen appliances to later meticulously restore them with scotch tape. Jorge, jardinero, poda la maleza. Nos vemos mañana. Que Dios lo acompañe. Jorge, the gardener is weeding. See you tomorrow. God be with you. Casa de los padres, un domingo de gordura, pantalón desabotonado. Toda idea es pecado capital en el sofá frente a la tele. Pasan la peli de uno con corazón de mandril. O eso desde niño le hicieron creer. El músculo débil sustituido por una fantasía. Parents house, a gluttonous Sunday. Pants unbuttoned. Every idea is a capital sin on the sofa, sofa in front of the TV. They show the movie about someone with the heart of a baboon, or since childhood, that's what they made him believe. The weak muscle substituted by a fantasy. Entregado a la interrupción, escribe esto. Sobre el bar donde hubo alegría, construyeron la catedral de todo lo que no me pertenece. Succumbing to the interruption, he writes this. Above the bar where joy had been, they built a cathedral out of everything that doesn't belong to me. Entregado a la interrupción, recita esto. Kiri Rex genitor ingenite. Vera Esentia Eleison. Succumbing to the interruption, he recites this. Kiri Rex Genitor Ingenite Vera Esentia Eleison. Antes me preocupaba la muerte, ahora el sobrepeso, el cerebro, órgano autónomo seducido por la frivolidad. Before I worry about death, now. Weight gain, the brain, autonomous organs seduced by frivolity. Dato estadístico. Tengo fotos que antes tuvimos. Un corazón débil sin fantasía. Statistic. I have photographs that used to be ours. A weak heart, no fantasy. Años y años, horas y horas dedicadas a ejercitar el cerebro que responde solo a lo superficial. Un órgano autónomo dicta el dolor no metafórico de corazón. Years and years. Hours and hours dedicated to exercising the brain, which responds solely to the superficial. An autonomous organ dictates the heart's not at all metaphorical ache. En mi cabeza hay una persona diminuta que pica piedras. También un cojo que arrastra su pierna muerta por la arena del Pacífico. Y la huella que va dejando parece la escritura de uno que te hizo daño. Y las olas vienen y la borran. In my head, there's a homunculus who skips stones, and also a man with a limp who drags his leg through the sand of the Pacific, such that the trail he's leaving behind looks like the handwriting of somebody who's hurt you, and the waves come, and the waves erase it. Conversaciones en las que no puede participar, pilas de libros pendientes, llaveros con focos inútiles, El camino de hormigas parece una grieta en la pared. Escribir en el propio antebrazo con el borde filoso de la uña cortada a diente. Súper. Arroz, mostaza, pasta de dientes, cinta scotch, acetaminofén. Jorge Jardinero, 224-5678. Súper. Sal. Conversaciones en las que no puede participar. 
Conversations you can't participate in. Piles of overdue books, keychains without working, flashlights. The line of ants looks like a crack in the wall. To write on one's own forearm with the sharp edge of a bitten off fingernail. Supermarket, rice, mustard, toothpaste, scotch tape, seaminifin, Jorge, the gardener, 2245678, supermarket, salt, conversations you can't participate in. Fotos mal centradas frente a monumentos ecuestres, el brazo de León Cortés, la sombra del brazo de León Cortés, sobre nuestra biología de 30 años. Todo, menos los extras de atrás, parece un montaje de Photoshop. Off-center photographs in front of equestrian monuments. León Cortés's arm, the shadow of León Cortés's arm, cast on the biology of 30-year-olds. Apart from the extras behind us, everything looks like a photoshopped montage. Los hijos de la Segunda República reprodujeronse a lo que venga, alimentaron a estos que se afeitan la cabeza, el pecho, las axilas. Secretamente saben que es el 2 de agosto, el día de la independencia. Children of the Second Republic reproduced without thinking, fed those who shaved heads and chests and armpits. Secretly, they know it's August 2nd, Independence Day. Cada cuatro meses, cual inspector fiscal, la madre pregunta si es adicto. Every four months, like a tax auditor, his mother asks if he's an addict. Dios guardi piensa, Dios guardi dice. May God keep you, she thinks. Bless, she says. Fotos mal enfocadas. Fotos de la gente que consume ansiolíticos envueltos en papel de golosina mientras ve películas mal dobladas. Una tarde, un cine de provincia, tanda para desempleados. Out of focus photographs, photographs of people who consume ansiolytics rolled up in candy wrapper while they watch badly dubbed films. One afternoon, a cinema in the suburbs a screening for the unemployed. Tengo esas fotos que antes tuvimos. Si superponemos los rostros, aparece Linda Blair. Aparece aquel travesti que conocemos desde la primaria. I have these photographs that used to be ours. If we superimpose the faces, Linda Blair appears, that drag queen appears, the one we've known since elementary school. En el lugar del corazón, una piedra con la forma de la Virgen Criolla que nos liberó de los españoles, de tu mamá, tus hermanos, del sobrepeso, de comprender el misterio de la Trinidad. In place of the heart, a stone in the shape of la Virgen Criolla, who liberated us from the Spanish, from your mother, from your brothers, from fatness from understanding the mystery of the Trinity. En la orilla del Pacífico mirábamos atentos el fuego como si fuera un tele inteligente. Los brillos del gel en tu cabeza eran estrellas mortales, diminutas, extinguiéndose. On the coast of the Pacific, we'd watch the fire attentively as if it were an intelligent TV. The glitter of gel in your hair was a host of mortal stars, diminutive, extinguishing themselves. Podría ser peor. Así llegamos a los 40. Pronto se despejará la bruma, Dios mediante, para tomarnos la foto de grupo, de país, para empezar donde se detuvo el cojo. It could be worse. This is how we arrive at our 40s. By the grace of God, the fog will soon disperse so that we can take a photograph of the group, of the country, so that we can begin where the man with the limp left off. Fotos mal sentada, centradas, cada cuatro meses, billetes defectuosos en el bolsillo del pantalón, 
el sol visto desde un planeta plano, los pericos de aquel mes, cuando bajamos los brazos creyendo que los subíamos. Off-center photographs every four months, effective builds in a pants pocket. The sun as seen from a flat planet, the parakeets that month when we lowered our arms, believing we were raising them. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. <laughs> Me gusta, I, I, I like this uh, lectura coral, no? Like a chorus. Yes, like a, it is like a chorus. Yeah. Like a litany. See, sí, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So I think we're going to open it up to Q&A. If folks have any um, questions, you can put them in the chat. Uh, we are all here to answer them. So we have a question. Um, Sam, can you talk us through your reading of yourself as translator who speaks both English and Spanish as a native speaker? Can you qualify the negotiations you may be making in practice? Okay. Um, yeah, I think that it's been interesting sort of balancing the colloquialism that I'm used to as a Spanish speaker, as a Venezuelan American person, and what we encountered from the Costa Rican um, Spanish, which uh, was a really interesting balance. Um, but uh, yeah, there would be times where I would just like kind of instinctually want to substitute something with something that was familiar to me and in, in my Spanish. and. Um, you know, we had to kind of balance that between the two worlds. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I think that it was a gift. I think it's a gift to be able to uh, read, you know, read Equestrian Monuments in the Spanish and be able to hear the music of it and the, you know, really understand the kind of drive behind it in, in the original Spanish. Um, but yeah. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. I wish I was more eloquent in answering it. <laughs> I, I would, I, I would, I would say that um, it depends a lot on on the type of uh, translation. You know, it, sometimes you're uh, you have to do it as part of your work which is okay and you can do a great work and, but you have like dates and you have a, maybe you're not fond of, a, of the work you're translating. And I think that the result will be like good work if you're a good translator, but uh, this kind of, of, of things translators do because they want to do them uh, with no hurry, uh, no, um, dates, you know, um, fechas limite, eh, what would be in English, um, um, due dates. Uh, I think that the, the approximation to this kind of, of translation is different. Uh, Borges used to, say, used to say that translation is more civilized than writing. Think about that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And I wasn't going to leave here tonight until somebody mentioned Borges. So Luis, thank you. <laughs> hey. Somebody put up long thing in the chat here. I don't think that's a question. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Oh. This is the first time I, I um, listened to the poem read aloud, read, in English, I mean. I, Is it the first time we read it? I think we read it at the Bowery Poetry Club. One other time, yeah. But did we but alternate but this that way? way? I don't remember. This way? I think we read a page, a page, a page. Yeah, it was 
yeah, and that was how long ago? Oh, when we first translated it. You know where it was, Julia? It was at that little weird art gallery. Uh -huh. I had just- Do you remember? Yeah, that was seven years ago. I remember that was seven years ago. Very postpartum, yeah, it was weeks after- Everything, it, everything that happened before May, uh, March 2020, I forgot. Yeah, that's right. That's Me right. too. <laughs> Me too. I forgot. But it was beautiful to hear the connection between the Spanish and the English, like at the in a parallel sort of setting. I thought that was yeah. really um, lovely. It was really beautiful. Sí, totalmente. Leon okay. Cortez, Leon Cortez, uh, who's mentioned there, uh, was the next president uh, that has a very uh, important monument, you know, very important avenue. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people love him. He was a fascist. <laughs> so, and, uh, those things that are not taught to you in history class in high school right. and, and elementary school, but he was a terrible, he was great. I don't know, he constructed a lot of bridges and I don't know, but he was terrible. Yeah. 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 And August, August 2nd, is because uh, uh, Independence Day, day for uh, Mexico and Central America is September 15. August 2nd is the day of the Virgin, of the Virgin. Huh. Yeah. Beautiful. So, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Um, it's National Poetry Month, so we're very excited oh. to be having this right now at the beginning of this month. Um, but I do have a question for everyone. What are you currently reading or enjoying throughout this uh, this changing in weather, this uh, new rebirth in this time? Does someone want to start? <laughs> uh, I, I, I already spoke too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's your night, it's okay. <laughs> That's it. I'm reading a novel in uh, translated. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. I read it when it first came out. Oh, and really? Yeah. Right? Weather, right? Yeah, the, yes, the weather, yes. Who translated it, Luis? I couldn't see from-, from Eduardo Jorda, uh, Spanish. This is a Spanish uh, publishing uh -huh. house. Uh -huh. uh, this is Spanish. Because of his last name, maybe uh, Catalan, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I am also reading uh, Paul B. Preciado. You know him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the monster who's in front of you. I don't know what in, in English. Este es el monstruo que os habla. This. Um, uh, uh, um, he's esta conferencia, this conference he gave mm -hmm. at this psychoanalysis uh, seminar or whatever um, against psychoanalysis, the way they see uh, trans people, and and it's great, it's great, it's very uh, provocative. That's what I'm reading. <laughs> so weird, Luis, is that when I read Weather, Jenny Ophel's Weather, um, and I'm a big fan of hers and started with the Department of Speculation, but when I, when I read Weather, I was in Costa Rica. I see. Um, um, this was maybe last fall. It took me a minute to get to it. Um, but yeah. So you, so you took the book to Costa Rica. Okay. Yep, I sure did. I read it in English. I didn't, I didn't have a translation then. Um, and it made me think, you know, midway through a disaster last year when we, we left New York for a little bit to go to uh, Montezuma, to Las Iglesias, that made me think I should be better prepared for additional disasters to come, you know, because she's all about <laughs> yes. preparedness in the book. And I thought, you know, we're halfway through this one. I don't think I, I prepared as I would have <laughs> liked to be. Mary Jo, what are you reading? How the, the mic, the mic is... It's muted. Okay. Oh. Can you hear me now? Okay, so because I'm teaching this poetry and translation class, I'm reading a lot of poetry and translation. 
including that's um, when I got to read Equestrian Monuments. And we just read um, a book of translations by Jay Kim called mm -hmm. Cold Candies, um, a book of Korean poems and um, by Lee Young Ju, J-U. And um, it's fascinating because it also prompted me to try to fathom the whole history of Korean poetry, which I have to say, I, I really didn't know a lot about and particularly about this new iteration, which is a very um, militant feminist um, pushback against what's happening there, which is what ha is happening here, which is kind of a rise of anti-feminine um, and anti-feminist thinking. So that was really interesting. The poems are very surreal. I also reread um, Elliot Weinberger's 19 Ways of Looking at Wang Wei, where he takes mm. this four line uh, Chinese poem and looks at 19 translations of it. And the reason I went to it was um, a dentist I know um, told me that everything that she knew about translation, she had learned from, from that <laughs> little book. And yeah, it's, it's really eye-opening about all the subtleties that people tend to ignore when they're translating because they, um, they don't understand translation. They think translation is paraphrase yeah. and um, it's not. Right. Yeah, no. so those are some of the things um, I've been reading and also the MFA theses for my students. And, Unfortunately, the sad New York Times um, every day and um, with the news of the war in Ukraine, which is heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, uh, I just finished uh, Soma Sharif's new book, Customs, uh, which mm -hmm. was astonishing. Absolutely incredible book. Um, and I've been returning to most of the poetry that Richard Howard translated. Uh, from the French, um, which has been such a joy. There's just so much work that he made possible in the world uh, for English speaking readers. And I've also gone back to his essays. I was just reading his essay about Dickinson a few days ago mm. and just reveling in his, uh, you know, his genius, so. That's beautiful. There's. <clears throat> Uh, I've been reading uh, in a similar direction, and um, Jameen, who I think is here tonight, um, but I can't uh, check now, uh, posted on Twitter um, a picture of one of Richard's annotations on Wallace Stevens' Aesthetic Human, and uh, made me go back to Stevens. And I've been um, kind of reading everything that I knew uh, Richard was sort of engaging that way, um, but also just reading a lot of Instagram and Twitter and uh, Facebook and catching up on anecdotes and stories and remembrances um, of people who were taught by him and held by him and published by him and mentored by him. And, um, it's just astonishing uh, the, the sort of scope uh, of his reach and his warmth and his love. And we were all sitting on the same sofa, you know, uh, under the same shelves. Um, you know, with the same antics, walking the same dog, it seems like, and, um, and I don't know, each remembering really different things, but, um, you know, left with all of that. Oh, yay. There's Jimmy. Jay, what you got? What are you reading? Mine was going to be, Sam, you took it right out of my mouth. I, I'm savoring reading Solmaz's book. I have it right here and I'm very slowly making my way Isn't through. Isn't it just, oh my God. It's it extraordinary. Is something else. She read it at the Y last week, right? Last Monday, Ricky? Yes. Yeah. But I think also you all had a great question in the chat. Mm. She did. I didn't see it. Mm. Track back up. From Tara. Oh, here it is. I'll read it out. What is the most rewarding part of the translation process? End of being translated. And then question B is, can I get question B? How does rest 
factor into your process of writing and translating, especially in this late stage pandemic uh, era. I hope you're right about that late stage pandemic era, at least. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, and I love that question, part two. Um, Sam, do you want to take the first part? Or Louise, do you want to speak to like, how is it being translated? Um, Sam, or yo primero, or part B, primero? Dale. Okay. Um, it's great. <laughs> uh, you know, the especially this not uh, this work that was not made in a hurry it took a lot of time uh for months i was thinking in i was not thinking about being translated but then judy our sam came up with a question or a suggestion and then i remembered and then all this time thinking that uh what was going on was exactly what I thought of um, Mary Jo reading of her translation that they were appropriating the poem. Is that all? Is that right? Do you understand? Estaban apropiando. They they were making this book their book in the best way possible, and this is great. That that is great. Um, yeah, that's what I can say. <laughs> it's great. Uh, well, I've never been translated, <laughs> but um, I think the most rewarding part of the translation process um, is just the kind of relationship that you build with the original work and the original author as you're kind of constantly in conversation with their decisions and um, the things that they sort of chose to do in their poems um, and sort of working on how how do we make those decisions work in the, in the English language that also we know Luis is making in the Spanish um, and and it's beautiful to see like when those things really line up um, when the conversation is just kind of seamless and we are you know just kind of working between both languages and and understanding where all of us are coming from um, that is the most rewarding part and of course holding this beautiful thing in our hands, um, you know, seeing it finally after 10 years uh, come together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what's been most rewarding about this translation specifically for me. Yeah, I, I am sort of overwhelmed with the sense of uh, reward right now and with all we've manifest and um, all that's gone into this over the last 10 years and would only say that that it was tonight, you know, reading uh, this title poem aloud, which is the one that took us uh, the longest, uh, and and not to translate, and not simply because it, it is long. Um, we really labored uh, over this one, and just to hear Louise, and then to hear either Sam or me read out. I mean, to hear Louise, I thought first of all, yeah. that's what we 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 would repeat the Spanish. I mean, over and over. So I could I could sort of close my eyes and kind of imagine you reading, but then to hear you read and then to, to have the translation do its part to really meet uh, the music in that Spanish and the pacing and uh, the colloquialism and, uh, and to do that with some economy because the English can really bloat things, right? So we, we had to be thoughtful about how not to drag um, the music out um, and, 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 and let it sing as it was singing for us in Spanish. And that, you know, it's not perfect. Translation is not uh, about uh, perfection. We don't even strive for this. But to get to get this I, writing is not about perfection either. No, life is not about perfection. <laughs> exactly. It's all it's all very messy. I feel like we're doing ourselves favors, even talking about an asymptote. Like we're not even that close. But you know, to hear you read and then to 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 read alongside you and to feel this sense that like uh, the the original and 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 the translation were in this nice. Uh, sort of this little dance. You know, I just thought, you know, the, the translation deserves to be uh, in the room with the dancing you do in your own poetry, which is an example of genius and innovation, like I said, and just wonder uh, for us. Um, you know, and to hear you read it, I have to say it was very moving tonight. So that's another reward is not only reading you, but to hear, hear you read. 
And this next question on how does rest factor yeah. into uh, the process, um, especially in this uh, late stage pandemic era, um, I think rest is big right now. And um, something Sam and I would build into our translations when we um, felt like we were cross-eyed, viendo visco, right? We, um, we would take a walk or we would have a drink or we would have a dinner and we would create some distance. And that rest was crucial. Either there's just parts of translation and certain other things, all of them important, you just can't muscle through. Um, and um, that was that was crucial. And I think um, there was a big rest taken, Sam, for me writing during the pandemic, um, at least these, these bigger rests, um, but I don't know, we could all answer this question about rest and, and the pandemic and what we've needed and how that's been different than what we needed before. I think um, writing and reading um, are things that <clears throat> move in the other direction of everything else. No, it, mm -hmm. they, they take time. You cannot uh, rush through reading or writing or translating. And that's why I think it's so difficult uh, to do. You know, it's it's easier to pick up the phone and scroll and because it's so fast, 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 or, you know, watch TV or whatever, uh, because writing or reading take time and you know it. Uh, so rest is very important. Uh, for me, uh, my way of meditating is sleeping. So I like rest. <laughs> I like rest. I like to rest. I'll just say, I think the most rewarding thing of being translated and translating is to bring something to new readers. And for instance, you know, many people will read Luis that wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And yes, they won't be reading him per se, but they will be reading something very close, an avatar as it were. Um, and I love that the original Spanish is on the page yeah. because one can uh, read it. And there are so many cognates um, and our lives here are filled with Spanish speakers. So, we, you know, we pick up things. So a lot of it one can follow along. And of course there is no substitute for hearing it, but eventually all of us leave earth um, and our voices fade anyway, and what is left is on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that for me, and, and the same is true of Dante, that's um, what's driven me to um, keep doing this is that I'm, my hope is that people will read my translation who wouldn't have read some yes. of the other translations. And if this sounds a bit like me, the problem for me with the other translations is they don't sound like anything. They don't sound yeah. like Dante and they don't sound like anyone else. They're just these kind of almost like machine, um, although they're done by people clearly, but these kind of um, produced um, replicas that I feel like Dante cared so deeply and that there's so much subjectivity in his poem. And that's what I'm trying to here and there infuse in it is his mm -hmm. wonder and his excitement and his love of Beatrice and those can get left out and you know it's it's there it's there in the language thank you for these wonderful questions everybody these are really terrific um all right. <laughs> um, should we? Okay, one more question. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going back to Borges, Luis. <laughs> uh, well, this is Borges' uh, line, right? Um, what he meant, I think, uh, I think we all kind of think we know Borges from reading him, but who knows? Um, I think he meant that it's a second time of writing. It's writing, writing it again. It's more civilized. It's a, it's a another layer of civilization. 
somebody thought of something, she or he wrote it, then comes another one and writes on top of this. I think that's what he meant. I don't know if you, you have another reading about this concept mm -hmm. of no, I think you're right. And I think, I think, you know, of course, Borges could make anything civilized, but you know, even when he imports something like Don Quixote, right, uh, which Edith Grossman translated, but for us, but when he's just taking Don Quixote and he's, he's importing it into a story, even that feels like a translation when he changes not a single word. You know, you're like, what are you doing here? And you read the text, you know, it opens these portals and these layers and these um, doors into that text, you know. So anyway, Borges is, yeah, that's a whole nother reading and conversation, um, which we have to have hopefully in person, um, given that we're in this late stage pandemic, uh, <clears throat> speak that into existence. Um, we should close soon um, to let uh, Carolina get back um, and to let all of you resume uh, life as normal, um, knowing that if you are uh, feeling like you, you can't go without uh, hearing Luis read. This will be a recording that we can make available after this night um, and you can get that again. But um, we should probably close where we began with a lot of gratitude for all of you being here. Uh, Jay and Mary Jo for you all uh, being here and reading. Um, Eric and Sarah Jean for making this beautiful book. Sam for co-translating it with me, which made it so much better than it ever would have been if we hadn't worked on it together. Um, what a treat. This is this is a big night for poetry and for translation. Yeah. And Louise, thank you so much for trusting yes. us with your beautiful work. It's Upstairs. really just been such a joy, truly. Thank you Thanks so much. You. Thanks to you, Jay, Mary Jo, Carolina, Eric, Sara, Marlo, Julia, Sam. Muchas gracias por todo. No, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.